Melikiliki Maka. That's Hawaiian for Merry Christmas. Hallelujah. He is born. So glad y'all are here. Oh, good. We can start now. Okay. She's here, everybody. Yay. Nice. Merry Christmas. So glad to see you all here this morning. You're all getting extra treasure in heaven for being here today. Do you know that there are churches that we're aware of that did not have worship this morning because it was Christmas? Linda's parents' church up in Oregon, they're one of quite a few, not doing Christmas worship because it's Christmas Sunday. <laughs> so we're good. Especially Asher. Doesn't everybody wish they had that hat? I wish I had that hat, man. Well, let's pray and we'll start our worship. Father in heaven, thank you very, very much, Lord, for the celebration of your coming to earth for us. We're so thankful, Lord God, for the miraculous nature of what we're focused on for this season. And yet, Lord, we love that it is ongoing. Thank you so much, Holy Spirit, for your presence with us and the sense of your actual gladness. Lord God, that you are glad we are here. That, that just means so much to us, Father God. We appreciate, Lord God, the souls who have come out in the fog and the cold and made Christmas more than just a holiday or a tradition. Thanks, Lord God, for the blessing of what you're doing and how you're leading at First Christian Church. We present ourselves to you this morning, Lord God, as gifts symbolized by Christmas and the giving that you gave. So we give ourselves to you, Father God. We just thank you so much, Lord, that you are willing to accept us as we are and Lord, we just want to praise you and thank you again and, and express the love that's in our heart for you this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Oh, holy night, the stars are brightly shining. Truly he told 
what an extraordinary thing he's done. Almost as extraordinary as the experience of doing a duet with John and Barry. <laughs> Truly miraculous. And uh, so some of you uh, may have been here. Uh, we're here last night. We did this. Uh, so we're going to sing the first verse of Silent Night. I mean, of this, this counter melody that goes with Silent Night. And don't worry if you don't know it. Just enjoy it. It's just cool little words. And uh, then we're going to do the first verse of Silent Night, which will be up on the screen. And then John and Barry will continue to lead you in the second verse of Silent Night. And we'll do both of them together for you. Hopefully you'll be blessed. On a moonlit night, a town is sleeping. Flocks are safe within the fold, free from danger, on or cold. I'm so thankful to be before you this morning to bring the message on Christmas Day. It's a, it's a joy for me, and I duly, truly do appreciate the opportunity. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, thank you very, very much for your presence with us. It's amazing how you speak to us in so many innumerable ways. Father God, we want to do one of the things that's most worshipful of all, and that's to listen. We just thank you, Lord God, for the amazing things you have to say to us in your word about who you are and what you've done. Lord, I just ask in the name of Jesus that each of us would receive your spirit of sharing right now. 
this day. So that as we encounter people who do not yet know you, who do not understand what Christmas really is, that we would have opportunity and be prepared to share. Thank you much, Father God, for taking my feeble words and as they leave my lips, putting your Holy Spirit on them, that they might fall on fertile soil in every soul. In Jesus' name, amen. Pastor Darren has been preaching on why the nativity, and so I just wanted to kind of finalize that, and, and uh, it's just such a great setup. I'm sure he would love to uh, be here, but we certainly understand the nature of family things and uh, holidays and schedules. I do want to just take a minute and say thank you uh, to you for being here. I, I just know that in terms of our leadership, there's a special resonation that happens. That they, they feel and understand how important it is for us to be together, to prioritize the things of Christ. We appreciate you being here very much. So why the nativity? I love this question. I, I, from the whole minute that they, that they handed me the info that this is kind of going to be the outline, I was like, that's such a great question. I love that it's why, not what. I, I understand the what of Christmas and the history and all that kind of stuff, but that's not what people struggle with mostly. See, you can't understand what Christmas is all about if you don't know the why of Christmas. The why of the nativity. One of the most difficult concepts of Christmas to understand is the issue of Jesus being God's son. Now this is hard for people, especially that haven't had a chance to have someone sit down with them and say, I, I want to make sure you understand what we mean, what we're talking about when we say Jesus, God's son. Most people read or hear the standard message of the baby Jesus that, that are unchurched, or nowadays we, we kind of tend to say de-churched. Because a lot of the people who are not in the church today were in the church. And they have become desensitized and de-inspired and demotivated. And they're not there anymore. They've lost a really, really important aspect of belonging to the body of Christ, belonging to Jesus, and that's fellowshipping and sharing and blessing one another. And so it's hard for them then to process these things. And a lot of people who don't know what the Word says would say, why would a loving God do that to his own child? Just got a great picture of the granddaughter of Bob and Leanne. Right? Granddaughter? Yeah. And there's no way I can... Pr it's Maya, I know, is the first name. But there's no way I can pronounce... the. How do you pronounce that? Maya Lifei Kakoi. Kakoi. Maya Lifei Kakoi. There'll be a test right after to see if you... <laughs> what an adorable little thing. Absolutely adorable. I sent back a facetious... They sent me the picture and I said, that almost as cute as Linda... How adorable. And it can, now, can you imagine anybody if Bob and Leanne said, well, hey, we're going to sacrifice our child so that everybody else can... Uh, be, blah, blah, blah. It's hard for them to process this. This is the toughest area for people it, when it comes to understanding Christmas and the why of the nativity. So how do we explain to people that Jesus is God himself come to us and not something or someone created other than him? Uh, very quickly, I'm going to put this in your heads and your hearts. You may know about this. You may understand this analogy. No human analogy is able to fully capture the divinity and <sighs> miraculous nature of God. But here's what has helped me when I try to help people understand about Jesus, who Jesus is, and when they call him the son, that it's a title, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And I say, you, you go in your refrigerator and you take out a cube of ice. And it's hard and 
you can toss it up in the air and catch it, and it's all kinds of different qualities. Good. What's that ice made of? Water. Okay. And then you put it in the pan on the stove, and you turn up the heat, and the ice begins to melt, and it turns to liquid, which has completely different qualities, and it's maybe used in different ways than ice. But that liquid now that used to be ice is still water, the exact same substance. substance. And when you heat that <clears throat> further, this cloud starts to rise up above the pan. It's steam. And it boils, and the steam goes up, and it, has, it floats. And the ice didn't float, and the water didn't float, and all kinds of diff temperatures and difference in temperatures. Steam. And what's the steam made of? water, the exact same substance. God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit are the exact same substance. They are Him. And so God Himself came in the form of a baby so that we could know that He understands the whole human experience, okay? So I'm not going to stay on that any longer. just want you to have that in your head to be, to be prepared to share with somebody else and to process what we're going to say further, see? So loving parents would die for their children, not sacrifice them. And this is exactly what God, as Jesus, entered this world to do, to die for us, His children. And so I confess, brothers and sisters, that Christmas happened and that the nativity is necessary because of me. <clears throat> I knew I'd get a, I'd go, oh, what do you just, uh, yeah, it's true. If all of you had been perfect and never sinned, Jesus would still have come as God to this earth, and, and he would still have done everything that he did from birth to death, the resurrection for me and for you and for every single person. This is who he is. This is what he does. He did this to save me from my sin consequences and to make it possible for me to become one of his children after rejecting him and to have a place and a part in his kingdom. His birth began the victory. The Apostle Paul says the same kind of things about himself. In 1 Timothy 1, 15-17, he says, Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance I'm going to paraphrase that and say, you can't say this too many times. Christ Jesus came into the world to save Rob. Who's the worst? But for that very reason, Rob was shown mercy. Mercy. So that in him, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his unlimited patience as an example for those who would believe on him and receive eternal life. I believe him. And it thrills me to sense his eternal life. Now to the king, eternal. That's right, we're saying happy birthday King Jesus today. Now to the King, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Say it. Amen. I'm always so impressed with how God spoke His Word to men and to people and who were called to write down exactly what He said. And one of the passages for me that is so impressive is John chapter 1, verses 1 and 14. I love putting them together. In just these two verses, God's Word captures Christmas for me. I hope for you. 
In verse 1 it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Jesus is the Word, the Logos. He was with God in the beginning. And then, the one who was God, the Word, became flesh. He became flesh and made His dwelling among us. We have seen His glory. Right? Right? We should be living like people who have seen His glory. Right? We have seen His glory. The glory of the one and only who came from the Father full of grace and truth. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I watch American Funniest Videos a lot. It's just hilarious to me, especially the animal ones. But I'm watching lately, and there's a bunch of Christmas episodes on there, Christmas. And the thing that gets me and the thing that the Lord speaks to me powerfully about is watching the reactions of kids. Linda can tell you, I never grew up. Okay? Body of a grown man, mind and brain and whatever of a 12-year-old. Okay? I fully admit it, apologize, I struggle against it all the time. And so I resonate when I see the pictures of these kids who open up these presents and go, well, this is stupid, I don't want this, and throw it down. I saw a picture of two sisters and they had both new bikes all wrapped up and they came out and the older sister goes, ah, and runs over to her bike and starts it. And the little sister goes, I don't want a bike. I want makeup. (laughs) Three years old. I want makeup. She really doesn't know what she wants, does she? And it hurts my heart to see that. Because it says to me that Christmas has become a time when we're supposed to get what we want, not what we need. But why the nativity, brothers and sisters? Because our greatest need is God our Savior. Amen? If our greatest need had been information, God would have come as an educator. If our greatest need had been technology, God would have come as a scientist. If our greatest need had been money, he would have come as an economist. If our greatest need had been entertainment, he would come as a performer. But our greatest need was forgiveness. Forgiveness for rejecting him. And so God came as the only one who could be a Savior of souls. This is the why of nativity. The why of Christmas. Understanding what we truly need is a huge part of having a God our Savior Christmas. Ask yourself what you've seen and heard this Christmas season. What have you seen and heard this Christmas season? When you watched the news, or you went out to do your shopping, did you see hassle and inconvenience? Or did you see sheep without a shepherd? Did you see only a faceless flow of people? Or did you see souls without a Savior? See, in this, as Christians, these things can be hurtful because it reminds us of the heartache of God. And yet at the same time, our hearts rejoice in personally knowing the Savior of souls. That's pretty cool. You don't know just about Him, have information about You know Him. He knows you. It's Personal. We know the why of the nativity. 
and Christmas. The big news of Christmas. Big news, brothers and sisters. Big news. I'm mindful of what happened in December of 1903. Y'all remember that, right? What happened in December 1903? I was still pretty young at the time, but I remember. <laughs> After many attempts, the Wright brothers were successful in getting their flying machine off the ground. Wow. Truly, look what has happened since then. Okay? We're, we're on the moon, people. We're on Mars. We have probes in interstellar space. We just got something set into orbit around the sun. Whoa. We've got the James Webb Space Telescope now capable of seeing him coming on clouds of glory. This is big. What happened with the Wright brothers? And they telegraphed this message to their sister, Catherine. They said, we have actually flown 120 feet. 120 feet nowadays. That's like, but 100, for, we've, we did it. Flown 120 feet. We'll be home for Christmas. And she grabs this telegram, runs down to the editor of the local newspaper, shows him this message. She's, you can imagine how excited she is. And he looks at it, and he goes, oh, well, that's nice. The boys will be home for Christmas. And uh, I, you know, I just, I just like to have fun. But I can imagine she's got that newspaper rolled up, and she would just go, read it again. Because all he saw was that the boys are going to be home for Christmas. He completely missed the big news, Kathy. The big news wasn't that the boys are going to be home for Christmas. Something incredible had happened. Man had flown. The big news, brothers and sisters, the joyful news is that God, our soul saver, has come as promised, and anyone can have his forgiveness. Big news. That's what we need to put in the newspaper of our lives. Christmas is not about getting what we want. Christmas is about being given. See, it's not about us getting. You can't. You can't get or earn or achieve what only God can do. But he'll give it to you. You see the symbolism of giving gifts at Christmas now? It's to remind us of the gift that he is. Big news. Our greatest need, mankind's greatest need, is a spiritual savior. A savior capable of saving us from the consequences of saying no to God's offer of adoption as his children. A lot of people don't understand that. A lot of people don't understand that we're not talking about, oh, you're going to go to hell. <clears throat> no, no, you're not going to be one of his children. And you won't have a place in his kingdom. You're going to be separated from him forever and ever and ever and ever. That's worse than anything anybody can imagine. The Savior, that Savior, is God Himself. Not some created thing that He sent down to be a sacrifice. It's Him, our Heavenly Father, who loves us and the world. That's right, for God so loved the world that He gave Himself as Jesus so that we can know that He loves us and, yes, so we can know that He truly loves us forgives all who come to him as the savior of our souls. See, it, it, it just he knew how hard it was going to be for us to receive his forgiveness. When you come into a, an awareness of how you've hurt him, 
it's hard to accept forgiveness, especially if he goes, oh, hey, don't worry about it. No, no. See, if I'd really hurt Linda bad, and I said, honey, I'm really sorry. She's like, ah, don't get aside. And I knew what I had done and how it hurt her. I, I couldn't believe that I had her forgiveness if she was just casual about it. And so he came to this earth himself in flesh, reduced himself down, did the whole human experience, birth, life, and death, so that we could believe that he really does forgive us, really does love us. Big news, brothers and sisters. This is why, as Christians, we have to be focused and faithful in making sure the real message of Christmas is displayed. Linda and I don't do snowmen and reindeer and Santa Clauses and elves and all those other things. All our neighbors do. We put the nativity scene out front. And we still put lights, but it's around the nativity scene. We have a chance to display the truth about Christmas, and it isn't Santa. Any more than it's the Easter bunny. See, if you're having a God our Savior Christmas, you can tell. It's not hard to examine yourself. You can tell. The Holy Spirit in you will interact in whatever you do for Christmas. That's the main way that you're going to tell. You can tell you, that He's involved and He's doing stuff and He's speaking things and you're hearing Him and He's prompting you and you're observing stuff that He's pointing out to you. A God our Savior Christmas. You won't just hear the repetition of music and carols. We did Joy of the World last night at Christmas Eve. Guess what song we're going to end with today? Again? I know. This is exactly what we're talking about, though. If all you hear is the words of the song and the message and you don't understand what's happening, if you're not having a God our Savior Christmas, that'll just be repetitive. Oh, we're doing the same songs over and over and over. And then it really does become empty. But not because he presented it to us empty. It's because we're not listening and looking for what he's put into it. You won't just hear the repetition of music and carols. You'll experience the Holy Spirit's fresh word to your soul in the message of those songs. The message, the scriptures of those songs. No matter how many times you hear them, the Holy Spirit will make it fresh and new and personal. You won't just be focused on what you want. You'll understand more and more deeply the big news of a God our Savior Christmas. And while hurt and loneliness can happen in the lives of people who know the Lord, a saving relationship with Him is a priceless gift of comfort and joy to us. For He is what we really need and, if you're honest, what we truly, most deeply want. See, your mind and your body can say, I want this, I want that, or I need this, I need that. But listen to your soul. That is the most deepest part of you. The inmost being. What's it saying? I already have the most price. I have a priceless gift. I have a Savior. He is Christ the Lord. He is what we really need and what we truly most deeply want. Instead of the falseness of a commercial Christmas, you can see and hear the message of our Savior all year long. When the angels had left the shepherds and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, 
Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. And when they'd seen him, they spread the word. It's big news. They spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child, and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. I don't think it's because they were so eloquent. I don't think it's because they knew the Greek. I think it's because of what was on their faces and in their voices and the truth of the experience that they'd had, which was being confirmed by the Holy Spirit in everybody that heard them. We have that same Spirit. We have that same Savior. It should be on our faces and in our voices all year long. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child, and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherd said to them. If you're having a God our Savior Christmas, he will be seen on your face and heard in your words after Christmas. And guess what? You'll be having God experiences all year long. (laughs) Let me just do this for you, okay? I'll do it from the pulpit even so you know it's okay. Because it's in your spirit, your spirit's going, oh, yeah, now we're talking, now we're talking. The soul rejoices in a way that the mind and body just can't. The only thing the mind and the body can do is follow. You get your spirit right, you get your soul right, the mind and the body will follow. God has given you authority for that. And why will you be having these God experiences all year long? Because, as Elder Barry spoke last night, the people walking in darkness, that was us, that's somebody that doesn't know him yet, have seen a great light. That's us who have seen, and we have received, we have heard, we do believe. Wow, that rhymed. <laughs> Write that down, somebody, that rhymed. In the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. How about, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Almighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. You see everything caught up put in this baby. It's God. Luke 2, 10 and 11. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. I bring you good news. Big news. Big news. Good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. Today, in the town of Pleasant Hill, Martinez, Lafayette, Concord. Where's, where is she and where's Maya? In West Africa. <laughs> A Savior has been born to us. He is Christ the Lord. Now, now, now here, here, here's something. You're going to run into people that Christmas has just been a big letdown. They come out of it depressed. You say, uh, 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 uh. that's because you're looking for Christmas under a tree or in a gift box. No wonder you haven't found it. It isn't there. If you don't have Christ in your heart, you will never find Christmas under a tree 
or in a gift box. But if you do have them in your heart, all these wonderful gifts you're getting from people, all these cards, all these expressions of love, the Holy Spirit puts himself into those and blesses you. And it's fresh and it's new and it's wonderful. And can't wait till Christmas again. The need for a Savior will always be the meaning of Christmas. It will always be the why of the nativity. The time of God's coming himself to save souls from the justice and consequences of not having him as Savior. I love how one of the Holy Spirit Christmas carols words it, no ear may hear his coming, but in this world of sin, where meek souls will receive him still, the dear Christ enters in. Hallelujah. What a gift. What a blessing. How remarkable. Just keep in mind as you get opportunities to share that to have a saving relationship with God, it's just a matter of receiving, not achieving. Oh, I'm not good enough. Oh, I've done all these bad things. It's about receiving, not achieving. You can't earn it. You can't be good enough. You have to just accept the gift. And the gift is an offer of spiritual adoption to be one of his children and to trust him in everything. Christmas. Next Sunday, I'm going to be preaching as well. And we're going to be doing a little kickoff on how to have a God our Savior 2023, whole year. I just hope you'll kind of sense that maybe the Holy Spirit has established a little bit of a platform for next Sunday, today. I hope He'll speak to you about that. Before we do communion, just want to let you know a few things in terms of prayer needs. Linda got a call from her mom today that her father had a stroke this morning and is in ICU, is doing as well as can be expected, and uh, we treasure your prayers for Dell. Sue Berthold, am I saying that right? Sue? Is having, I know, I know. Is having back surgery, and we've we know about that. She's going to be gone for five weeks. Did you say? At least five weeks. So church is going to be canceled for about five or six weeks. <laughs> until Sue gets. We'll miss you. Make a note to just keep her before the Lord, and make sure you thank Him for being with her. Okay, don't have to ask Him. He's with her. You can thank him for being with her. There's also a few gifts on the little table back there with some bows on it. If you want some Christmas music, Linda and I have done a little bit of a CD with Christmas music. If you want to have that as a gift or share it, give it to somebody, uh, please feel free. <clears throat> They're only $200 each. <laughs> You can pay us when you get to heaven because we'll have all of our spiritual treasure there anyway. And so it's no big deal. Okay. Can we just pray? Father God, thank you so much for knowing all these needs before they happened. Holy Spirit, thank you very much for being so present with those that are hurting and, and have stuff scheduled that's going to be difficult. But Lord, we know that in all of the human difficulties, you can bring such victory, such peace, such strength, such amazing recovery that even the doctors and the nurses would take notice. Thank you, Father God, for the communion we're about to receive. Thank you, Lord, for how it helps us to remember who you are and what you've done. And that we're to always give thanks. Thank you, Lord God, for being God our Savior. In Jesus' name, amen.
Thank you, Rob. Thank you for being here. Thank you for making this an important part of your Christmas celebration. Thank you for making our joy complete by you being here. Doesn't it feel great to come together and even when it's sad or bad news that we can come together and pray, don't you feel better? We had the opportunity to pray for Linda and Sue this morning and it just felt good. Not because of any suffering, but because I feel like I'm really making a difference when I do that. We believe we're really making a difference. And when we have holidays, Christmas, New Year's, birthdays, we come together. That's what we do. We come together as community, or family, or friends, whatever you happen to call it. And that's what communion is about. Notice communion and community, commune, they all sound so similar because they got the same root. It's gathering together. And that's what we do. We make a point of doing that every week here. That's one of the restoration principles that we cling to. And uh, our challenge is not to make it routine. Uh, I think Rob was right on target when he said, you'll hear the same song 10 times, and if, if you don't have Christ in your heart, you're gonna get tired of that song. If you don't have Christ in your heart, you might get tired of taking communion. So that might be a little challenge to a few people. Uh, but I know not you guys, so thank you for that. Um, Paul, to the Corinthians, kind of chastised them about the way they were taking communion. They were coming in, and they called it a love feast. They didn't just have a little cup or a little wafer. They had a big meal, but they stopped in that meal and made a significant point of having their communion as part of that meal. But some people were coming in and, you know, they were more focused on having the meal, or getting in and getting out, than they were on the communion. So he let them know that wasn't right. But he said a couple of really positive things in there. So from um, 1 Corinthians 11, I'm going to read... Um, 11.33, which is a little past where we usually read. So, dear brothers and sisters, when you gather for the Lord's Supper, wait for each other. If you are really hungry, eat at home, so you won't bring judgment on yourselves when you meet together. And then in 12.12, 12, he says, the human body has many parts, but the many parts make up only one body. So it is with this body the body of Christ. And that's what we're doing. We're gathering together. We're focusing on our communion, our community, being together, supporting each other. And we're remembering not only that Christ died for us, that he came for the express purpose of sacrificing himself for us. We didn't deserve it. I didn't have to tell you that. I don't deserve it. You can't stand up here and, and accuse other people. You got the other four fingers pointing back at you. Um, it's something that we realize when we come up here. Is we're, we are, like Paul said, I'm the greatest sinner. I know my sins. Um, but God came for me, for Rob, and for every one of you. And he came for those people that are driving down the street that don't know him. So that's part of our challenge is to help them find out about God. So on the evening that God was about to go to the cross and suffer for us, he took the bread and he blessed it. And he said, eat this in remembrance of me. Then later in the meal, he took the cup and in the Jewish tradition, it's known as the cup of redemption. And he said, this is my blood given for you as the new, test, new covenant. Do this as long as you do it in remembrance of me. Let's pray. 
Heavenly Father, thank you that we can gather together here as a family, Lord, that you have brought us together, the many parts, but we are now one body, one bride, your bride. Lord, I thank you that this morning we celebrate your birth, that we celebrate God cracking the world open to share with us the love that he wanted us to have. Lord, it's hard to imagine you in a manger, innocent, a baby, and then think about you going to the cross and suffering so terribly. But that's what you did because you loved us. Lord, I thank you. I lift up our family to you. I lift up those that can't be here with us this morning. Lord, those that are suffering in illness or in pain, Lord, we ask for your relief. Those that are in the hospital, Lord, be with them, comfort them, guide the doctors. Lord, those that are facing surgery, that are worried about, will they be able to walk? Will they feel better? How long will it take? Be there, Lord. Hold your hand out and walk us through it as you love us so much. And I ask for all this through the strength and power of Jesus Christ. Amen. Oops. All right, I'm going to ask you to stand. And because it's hard to be really joyful when you're sitting down. I know you can do it, but if you don't want to stand, don't. If it hurts to stand up, don't. Okay? Stand up in your soul. Okay? If at any point you need to sit down, go ahead. I'm talking about spiritual stuff, not physical and stuff now. Good job. We could hear you. We could hear you up here. Good job. Holy God, wonderful Savior, amazing Lord, incredible ruler, ultimate sacrifice. We love you. Thank you so much, Lord God, for loving us and making it possible for us to know you and then subsequently to love you. Father God, we thank you for forgiving us of our sins, for being the Savior of our souls. And we repent. We are sorry 
for the times we hurt you. It does make it obvious that we need you, Lord God, because otherwise our sins would defeat us and keep us out of your kingdom in your arms. But you, Lord God, have shown us your heart, not only what you've done, but who you are. And Lord, it just we're once again, even though this is the umpteenth Christmas we've celebrated, we are newly amazed and feel the wonder of your glory and your love and your power. Thank you for opportunities to share, Lord God, what you're speaking to our spirits, that someone else may come to understand the miracle, the amazing nature of Christmas and the resurrection and life with you. We love you, Lord God. Happy birthday, King Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. Happy birthday.